which is the Ethics Club on campus. Today, I am here to introduce Jim Park of Otter Products. Not only is Jim the president and CEO of Otter Products, he is also the CEO of their parent company, Blue Ocean Enterprises. Aside from these two roles, Jim also has several other responsibilities, including, but not limited to, serving on the board of directors for several startup companies. Jim also has a few degrees under his belt, including a Master of Law from New York University School of Law. Today, Jim will be speaking on how students and employees can go further through the use of technical skills. Please welcome Jim Park. All right. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with you today to, to share a little bit with you about the topic of ethics and what ethics means in terms of building a, a solid career. Now let me just start off by saying I am not an academic. I've, I've, I've been through a lot of years of school and I've got degrees, but I'm not a professor. I'm not somebody that has based what I'm going to say on years of research and empirical evidence. What I'm going to share with you is personal observations that I've made over a long time of watching people of uh, experiencing challenges in the business world. And I can make a couple of promises to you based on what I've seen. Number one, you are going to deal with ethical dilemmas in your career. You're also going to deal with those in other areas of your life, not just your career. And being equipped with the skills to navigate those things is the difference between a lot of happiness and a lot of regret. And so what I'd like to talk with you about today is a few tips on what it would look like for you to build a foundation right now um, in order to make sure that you are able to not only live the life that you want to live, but to do so in a way that you can be proud of it at the end of your life. So um, there's a few things that I want to share with you, and I'm going to give you the punchline right at the beginning here. There are six different things that I want to talk to you about, and I'm going to tell you about these each individually, but I want you to be able to see that. We're going to focus first on finding that definition of what success looks like for you. That's a really important thing because it's really tough to shoot an arrow at a target if you can't see the target. And if you don't know what you want to accomplish in life, it can be really difficult to know if you've ever achieved that. The next piece is some advice on how you start your career and what you should really be looking for um, in that first job that you have because you're all very close to that in terms of the next few years of your life, you're going to be making some really important career-related decisions. Then we're going to talk a little bit about um, why maybe money may not be the most important thing, especially in the beginning stages of your career. We'll talk a little bit about the law and how that relates to your own moral judgment. Um, we'll talk a little bit about your reputations and then finally about the impact that you have in the world. So I'm happy to answer questions at any point during this and I'll also reserve some time at the end to answer any questions that you might have. Um, let me just tell you that I'm going to tell a lot of stories throughout this and these are stories of myself and people that I know and I'll give you as much detail as I, as I possibly can in any of these. So let's start by talking about what does your vision for success look like? If you stop and you were to write down on the piece of paper in front of you a, a paragraph describing your life 30 years from now, there's going to be some elements that are going to be important for each of you. There's going to be things about your career. There's going to be things about your family. There's going to be a lot of elements to that. But if you don't determine what that vision looks like, you're going to be left in a scenario where each individual decision will end up shaping that destiny for you. If you don't choose your future, somebody else will. And sometimes the opportunities that are going to be put in front of you are not going to be the opportunities that you would have wanted to take advantage of. So one of the first is education. Um, you know, I, I went to a college that um, some would say would be a rival of UNC, Weber State University. And what I saw is that a lot of people started at college and then never finished college. And I deal with a lot of people on a day in and day out basis that live with a constant regret in their life that they never finished what they started. And you've all heard about people that have dropped out of college and gone on to be multi-billionaires. I work for one of those people. They're real. 
For every one of them, there are tens of thousands of people that live with regret that they didn't finish what they started. And every time they apply for a new role at their work, every time they apply for a new job, they're left with this lingering sense of um, just fear and um, a sense that maybe they're um, not going to be the right person simply because they don't have that piece of paper. It doesn't matter so much what your degree is in, but the idea of finishing what you started makes a big difference. It will make a big difference for you psychologically, and it will make a big difference in your ability to advance in your career. Because for good or for bad, that is a litmus test that's used in a lot of application processes. Um, at Otter, we get over 100 resumes for every single open opportunity. There is no possible way that we can get to know each of those candidates to determine who is the best person. So we have to use some things to weed out candidates. That's just the way the world works. It may not be fair, but it is, but it is, right? Don't let yourself, through your education, be put in a position where you're going to be sorted out of the stack before you even have a chance. Finish what you've started here. And for a lot of you, that's still not going to be enough. For a lot of you, you're going to have to take some extra steps. So I went and got my Juris Doctor degree after I finished my undergraduate. And I thought, this is going to be great. I'm going to practice law. That's exactly what I want. And I got to a point where I was about to graduate from law school. And I was working for a really big law firm. And I was in their litigation group. And I, I was doing exactly what I had wanted to do for my career. I had a great job offer. I was going to make a lot of money. And I had one of these moments where I looked around me and I realized that all of the attorneys that I was working with were divorced. They had estranged relationships from their kids. Most of them had some sort of substance abuse challenge. And this is like a top international law firm that we're talking about here. And I realized none of them are happy. They've chosen something that has made that a real challenge for them. And I, and I had one of those moments where I had to step back. And I, and I had to say, what is going to be my definition of happiness? And I decided that I was going to go back to school and get a postgraduate degree so I could change the type of law that I practice. And I, I get ready for this. I focus in tax law. It's exciting. It's super sexy. It's fun. <laughs> right? But it, it may seem a little bit mundane, but it allowed me to have the family life that I wanted, which was really important to me. I've never regretted making that compromise to do something that I really like instead of something that I love because it's allowed me to be with the people that I really love. And I think that's a really important thing that all of you are going to have to make decisions in your career as it relates to how you spend your time and where you spend your time and what stresses you allow to get in the way of, of other things in your life. Um, the next thing that you want to think about in terms of creating this vision for your future is what is it that you want to do? I made a mistake in undergrad. I got a poli-sci degree. Um, do you know what you do with a poli-sci degree? You've got two choices. Law school or unemployment. <laughs> Unless you want to be a professor, and I'm just not smart enough to do that. So um, I had no choice but to go on to graduate school. And for many of you, you may find that once you finish your education here, the graduate school is the, the best next step for you. I would highly encourage that. Because it, again, it will give you a different position in that stack of resumes as you go throughout your career. Even more importantly than that, it will allow you to build relationships with other people at a similar level of, of ambition and drive. And those will be people that will make a meaningful difference for you in a lot of cases throughout your entire career. Um, my chief legal officer is a guy that I went to law school with. Um, I know him, I trust him, I know that he's intelligent, I know that he has integrity. It was a really easy pick when it came time for me to choose that person to be the lawyer that, that ran all the legal affairs for our corporation. I knew exactly who I wanted. And it wasn't somebody who sent me a resume that I'd never seen before. It was somebody that I knew from graduate school. Right? When you look at where your career goes, you need to be thinking about, okay, what is it that you really want to do? And what is it that you're okay doing? If what you really love to do is play the guitar in your garage, that's wonderful. I hope it works out for you. I, I truly, truly do. For a lot of people, that doesn't work out. And so sometimes you need to separate 
what you love to do and that can be your hobby versus what you can make a living doing or what you can do in order to provide the living that you want for yourself and your family. That's a really important principle and a lot of people that choose to follow their passion as their career find that that passion is no longer a passion and it becomes a source of disappointment for them. And I've seen a lot of instances of that. That doesn't mean you can't play the, the guitar in your garage all you want. It just may mean that you need to have a day job on the side. Right? Um, as you look at your career, one of the things that's going to be really important is to decide where you want to live. Because if you want to live in Greeley, then you need to make sure that you start your career in Greeley and that you are doing everything that you can to rise up in the community and become very well connected here. If your goal is not to be in Greeley long term, you need to consider that as part of your career plan. And when you look to take that first job, that's got to be an active thing for you to consider. Right? I went to um, my undergraduate in Ogden, Utah, and one thing I knew is I did not want to stay in Utah. I've got nine siblings in Utah, and a whole lot of nieces and nephews, and that means that we've got a lot of family politics. And I needed at least the Rocky Mountains as a buffer between me and all of those people. <laughs> And so I made the conscious decision to go to graduate school away from there. There were a lot of good universities near there, and I chose to go away in order to be able to have the opportunity to, to end up where I wanted to be long term. If you don't, if you don't set the goals for what you want your career to be, what you're going to find is that you get into your first job and you either do well or you don't, but eventually you'll be offered different positions and you'll find that five years into your career, people have decided where your career is going to end up and you have very little say in it. The only thing you've been able to say is yes, I like that, that opportunity or no. But if you're not if you're not intentionally driving for where you want to be, you'll find that you get pigeonholed really, really quickly. That's an important thing. You've got to have this vision of where you want to be. The other thing is you've got to have an understanding of what your life is going to look like outside of work. My goal in life is not to make as much money as humanly possible. I've made a lot of money in my life, and what I've found is that the happiness that I have doesn't come from that money. It makes for convenience. It makes life a little bit more fun every once in a while. But I'll tell you what, if one of my kids was sick, I'd give every dollar that I have to make sure that they got better. Right? There are some things that simply matter more than other things. And to have an understanding of not only what you want to do in your career, but the people that you want to surround yourself with, your family, your friends, is really important. And how are you going to find balance throughout the various times and time periods of your life? There may be some times when it's necessary to really focus very heavily on your education. Right now is one of those times. There will be times that you've got to focus on your career really heavily. But if you do those things to the neglect of your family, what you eventually find is regret. And I've never seen any exceptions to that rule. I've never seen any exceptions to that rule. Um, family makes a difference in a way that money and degrees don't. And if you don't have family, friends fill that same void. But you've got to make sure that you're not prioritizing what you love over who you love. Because that's, it's such a common mistake. And it will take you off the course that will allow you to engage in ethical decision making. And I'll talk to you about some examples of that in just a minute here. So the second tip that I would give you is pick your boss. Statistically, the number one thing that causes people to either like their job or not has nothing to do with the benefits, has nothing to do with the pay. Those are factors and they're correlated that they're I mean, they, they have some impact, but the number one impact factor is your relationship with your boss, especially at the beginning of your career. If you choose somebody that is going to be willing to invest time in you, it will pay dividends throughout the entire rest of your career. And you need to be able and willing to think about that. If you choose to work for a jerk, don't be surprised when you're not happy. Don't be surprised when you yourself turn into a jerk because you're modeling the behavior that somebody else has shown you. It's just the way that things happen in life. It's the way that things happen in business. I've seen a lot of really good people come out of school and they go to work for the wrong company. And a few years later, I'm like, oh my goodness, I don't even know that person. 
because they've allowed themselves to be influenced by that first boss. Be really careful in who you choose. And if you, if you choose to work for a company rather than an individual, meaning if you choose to go to some company because it's a big name company, even though you're going to have a really bad boss, there's going to be consequences that go along with that. I would prioritize choosing the right boss over the right salary, over the right um, company name on your, um, on your employment letter, because you're going to learn things, especially at the beginning of your career, that are going to make a big difference as you go throughout. The two men on the screen here are people that have been mentors for me. They've made meaningful differences in my life. The guy on the far left there, his name's Ned Miner. He's an attorney in Denver. And in the first part of my career, while I was practicing law, before I became a CEO, um, he was the most influential figure in my career. And we spent a lot of time together. And the thing that was really important to me is that he was willing to invest time in me. And he was willing to give me honest feedback. And he was willing to correct me when I needed to be corrected. That's a really, really important thing. Because if you only look for people that tell you how wonderful and smart and pretty you are, you're going to find that you never grow. Feedback is an absolute gift. Um, one of the other things that I learned from him is that there is no amount of money that will ever um, make you comfortable looking at yourself in the mirror if you make ethical compromises. That's a really important lesson. Um, in lots of areas and lots of careers, you're going to run into opportunities that you can choose a path of making a little bit extra money, and all it will cost you will be your integrity. Right? That's a trade-off that's never worth it. The other guy here is Kurt Richardson. He's the founder of Otter Products. Now, he's not a guy that went to college. He's one of those people that became a billionaire um, because he has just ridiculous intelligence and he didn't need a university because he started his own company. He is one of the most genuine, caring people that I've ever been around. And one of the things that I've really learned from him is the idea that being in business is not about being selfish. It's about what you can give to other people. It's about the difference you can make in other people's lives. And if there's one thing that I would have you remember from today, it's this. Focusing on other people will be the biggest factor in allowing you to make ethical decisions. If you're focused on selfish motives, you are much more likely to be um, willing to make ethical compromises. Selfishness leads to ethical compromises. Being selfless is a good, um, it's a good inoculation against that, against that. And that's one of the things that I've learned from Kurt Richardson. Um, what are the qualities that you should be looking for when you are looking for this boss? And some of you are thinking, you know, depending on how the economy is, I'll be lucky to get a job offer. Don't sell yourself short. I would make sure that you're looking for at least two things in this person, and, and actually it's three. But number one, you've got to find somebody that's smart, smart enough to teach you, smart enough that you're not going to be the smartest person sitting at the table, right? Somebody that knows their crap really well and that you can learn from. Because in most cases, you're not going to leave the university with all the skills that you need to be professional, be successful as a professional for your entire life. That's not what the university system is designed to do. The second thing is I would look for ethics. Does this person treat other people well is a really good litmus test. If he, treat, he or she treats other people well, there's a higher likelihood that they're going to be focused in a selfless way versus a selfish way. And that's a really important thing to think about because if they treat other people poorly, and look at how they treat people that they don't have to treat well. Look at how they treat the administrative assistant. Look at how they treat the waitress. That's a really good indication when you don't have a lot of other information in front of you about what type of person that you're going to be working for. The third is, I would, when, when you get to that part of the interview when they say, do you have any questions? Here's a question that you can ask and it will impress almost any, any boss. What does mentoring look like within your company and what can I expect to learn from you? It's one of those things that puts them in a position where they start to see themselves as having an obligation, a responsibility, not just to do their job, but to invest in you. And that's really what you want. You want somebody that's willing to invest in you. 
If you find that they're not willing to invest in you, you're also going to find that in most cases you don't progress very far in your career unless you proactively look for other mentors, other people to teach you and guide you. Okay. Um, the other thing that's really important is that as you run into to decisions in your work where it's really difficult to know what the right answer is, you need somebody that you trust to be able to sit down in your office and call up and say, help me think through this situation. So let me give you a couple of examples. If you're in a position and somebody wants, so let's say you go into human resources, and I'm, I'm sure that there will be some of you in here that will do that. And you get somebody that lodges a, a complaint for sexual harassment against another employee. And there's no witnesses, and it's he said one thing and she said another thing. And there's a whole bunch of complicated and, and difficult factors involved in that conversation. How are you ever going to know what the right answer is in that situation? Let's say that one of these people is somebody that you know and they're your friend. And that takes away your ability to be truly objective. What are you going to do? Sometimes you need to be able to pick up the phone and talk to somebody else and say, help check my thinking on this because I am too emotionally caught up in this situation. I'll tell you another situation where this happens all the time. You guys will have a chance to manage people throughout your career. And one of the things that you're going to find is that you're not going to spend a whole lot of time managing your top performers. You're going to spend a lot of time managing people that don't do their job really well. And sometimes the reason they're not doing their job really well is because they've got all sorts of problems in their personal life. So when somebody comes to you and says, I'm getting a divorce, and then their performance falls off the map and they're not doing well in their job. How do you know what the right approach is to work with that person and to help them and how long you should be working with them and what you should do to support them versus what would be enabling them? If you really care about the people that you're leading, you're probably going to get lost in that situation. And you're going to need other people on the outside to take an objective look at it and to check your thinking. Because your heart and your, and your head are going to be in very different places as it relates to those situations. One of the best ways that you can make sure that you don't get caught in an ethical bind is to seek advice from people you trust. It's so very important that you choose that person that you're going to work for and that they be that person for you. Right? Um, so the next one is be willing to pass up short-term money. If it means compromising your integrity, you've got to be willing to pass up short-term money. So let me give you an example of this. We found that we had a factory in China, and um, you know when we did an audit, we found that they had some people on their factory floor that we suspected were underage. Child labor is not something we mess around with, and so we immediately terminate the relationship with this factory. I'm just I'm not going to waste time doing business with people that don't have ethics and morals and that are willing to exploit other people. Well, they sent a delegation of people to visit us in Fort Collins, and they decided that they were going to tell us that it was a mistake, they thought the 15-year-old was really 35, they would never do anything like that again, and we had a meeting with them and we chose not to give them any more business. But when we were there, they brought a box of cookies for each person in the room. And I wasn't there in this meeting, but they handed our um, director of supply chain, whose ultimate responsibility it was to choose which factories we used, handed him a box of cookies. I thought, okay, we have a corporate policy. Anything that's less than $25 you can accept as a gift. He was, you know, in good line with that. We thought, this will be fun. I'll take these cookies from China home and share them with my kids. Got home and opened the box of cookies. <laughs> $10,000 in uncirculated bills. You know what we call that? We call that a bribe. Do you think that they gave him that money simply out of the goodness of their heart? <laughs> the answer is no. They want something, right? So now, imagine that you are this person. You just open a box of cookies and there's $10,000 cash here. What can you do with $10,000? What can you buy? How many student loans does that pay off? What does that do for your mortgage? What kind of car can you put a down payment on with $10,000, right? 
And do you know who's going to know about it? Nobody. Because you don't have to tell anybody, and nobody else is there when you open the box of cookies, and the people that are trying to bribe you are sure never going to tell anybody. It sounds like a perfect crime, right? All it costs you is your integrity. All it costs you is the ability to look in the mirror and like what you see. And I'm not talking about not having baldness. I'm talking about <laughs> self-respect, right? That's an important thing. Well, this individual had integrity. When this individual said, you know what? I don't know what to do yet. I'm going to call our legal department and say, how do I handle this? So he called up and he said, you know, I, I opened this, there's all this cash here, I don't know what to do, I didn't even eat the cookies, can you come and get this? And so we were able to take care of that for him. Do you know how much respect and how much trust I as a CEO have in that employee? Do you know how much more money he's going to make over the term of his career because he did the right thing there than he ever would have made if he had put that money in his bank account? Think about that for a second. He could have taken the easy road and then $10,000 richer in that moment. Or he can do the right thing knowing that he's giving up that money and he can then be in a situation where he can make hundreds of thousands of dollars more throughout his career because he has a reputation for being somebody with integrity. I found out about this situation and so um, our company meeting a little bit later, we called this individual up on stage and it was an interesting day because it was the same company meeting where we introduced Peyton Manning as our corporate sponsor or our, our celebrity spokesperson. And so Peyton Manning was up on stage and I brought him up on stage and there was this big round of applause and everybody was so excited and so happy. And then with Peyton um, there, I, I told this story about this individual that this happened to. This guy got the bigger applause than Peyton Manning did. It's meaningful. And so what we did as a company is we then handed him a check that after tax we yield $10,100. Because we wanted to prove a point to our people that doing the right thing is always the right thing. It will always pay off more in the long run. That person's received several promotions since that time. Life works out better. And do you know the best part? It has nothing to do with the money. The best part is... He can go home and look at his kids and know that he's living the life that he wants them to live. He can look in the mirror and not have regret. He can, he can smile and not feel like he's a hypocrite or a phony or a fake. And there's no amount of money that he could ever spend to get that back once you sell that. Right? That's a really, a really important thing to keep in mind. Sometimes people think you have to choose between being profitable and being ethical. And I'm here to tell you that there may be short-term decisions where you're making that decision, but in the long term, there is an absolute correlation between ethical behavior and being profitable. Do you know what I never have to worry about? I never have to worry about going to jail. I never have to worry about a government investigation. I never have to worry about somebody coming back and saying that we cheated on a contract. That gives me the emotional energy, that gives me the mental energy and the freedom to do a lot of things that I would never be able to do if I was constantly trying to cover my tracks. It's just the reality of life. And once you take that first step down that path where you start making those first ethical compromises, it becomes really, really challenging for you. Let me tell you another story. Um, I had an employee that worked in our building. So a lower level hourly paid employee and his job was to do maintenance on our buildings. That's it. I left my office one day, and I had left on my desk a piece of paper. And it had some salary information for some of the employees in the company. And I came back to work the next day, and I found this gentleman. So this is 6.30 in the morning, and he's sitting outside of my office. And it's apparent that he's just in rough shape. He is, he is beside himself. His face is red. I can tell he's been crying. And I said, come on in, let's talk for a minute, what's going on? And he said, I was working late last night, and I had to change a screen in the window of your office, and I came into your office, and I saw that piece of paper on your table. And I looked at it. And I just wanted to tell you that. He didn't do anything with it, he looked at it. But he was so torn up inside that he had compromised his own values that he had to step forth and tell me about it. 
something should happen to that employee. Well, it started with a raise and then a promotion, right? Because what do I know about that person now? I know that I can trust them. Now, that's not always going to be the case when you come clean from something that you've done wrong. But it was a situation where truly nothing bad had happened. And I learned something really important about this employee. His integrity and his desire to do the right thing was more important than his job to him. And that's somebody that I can put in a lot of situations because I know that they're going to do the right thing. Do you think I'm ever going to worry about him stealing pencils from the office? Do you think I'm ever going to worry about checks going missing when he's around? No. No, because I, I have somebody that I can trust. And I will make sure to protect that employee until my last day with the company. Regardless of what happens, he's going to have a job and he's going to have prosperity because I know that he's somebody that we can trust. Um, tip number four. Just following the law may not be good enough. So let me ask you guys a question by raise of hands. How many of you would be willing to turn your moral judgment in life over to Congress? That they could decide right and wrong for you for the rest of your life, including who you're going to marry, how many children you're going to have. No hands? Yet somehow, as a society, we think that just because something is legal, that makes it right. Think about that for a second. Are there some things that are right and wrong, but they may be legal either way? Let's, let's look at a couple of examples. There's no law against gossiping. If you go to your job and you decide that you're going to be the, the office, office gossip, is that going to have ramifications for you? Is that going to damage relationships? Just because it's legal doesn't make it right. The same thing with stupidity, right? You can go to your job and you can be the dumbest person there and you can put in the least amount of effort there and you're never going to get arrested for that. Does it make it right? Does it make it right for you not to put in the same effort and intellectual rigor as everybody else, right? There's a lot of things that you're going to rationalize your way into and a lot of really bad conduct that you're going to be involved with if you decide that your moral, your moral base ground is whether something is legal or not. That's a really important thing. Now, let me, let me just pause for a second. I, I talked about this in another college in Colorado, and I got a note afterwards from a student saying, thank you for explaining that we don't have to follow the law. <laughs> That's not what I'm saying. Please, please know that. As, as an attorney, as a human being, please follow the law. But if you're gauge about whether something is right or wrong is simply it's legal so it must be right, may I suggest that there's a little bit more rational thinking that needs to go into that equation. You need to be willing to ask yourself, how does this impact other people? And you need to understand what your standard is for right and wrong. And if your standard for right and wrong is whatever is going to get you the most gain in any situation, I will suggest to you very powerfully that that's probably a recipe that's going to lead to a lot of regret and unhappiness in your life. It just simply is. It would be great if we all had a perfect conscience and there was an exact right or wrong in any situation, but that's not the way that it works in life. Sometimes there will be gray areas. Sometimes there will be a lot of gray areas. So when you're in a position in a company and all of a sudden the budget isn't working the way you needed it to or a big client leaves and you have to decide how are we going to pay the bills this month? Are we going to be letting employees go? Or are we going to breach contracts? There's a lot of really tough questions that you're going to have to ask yourself. And sometimes you're not going to be able to say this is exactly the right answer in these situations. It's important in those times that you get advice from objective people that are not so emotionally wound up that they're going to rationalize their way into making bad decisions. Rationalization is your worst enemy when it comes to ethical decision making. And I hope you keep that in mind. Any one of you has the ability to talk yourself into prison. Any one of you also has the ability to talk yourself into a life of happiness if you're willing to avoid rationalization. Let me tell you a story. 
Um, we were working on, and, and this is illustrating that just because something is legal doesn't mean it's the right thing. We were working on buying a company, and we were negotiating a contract, and as we were trading drafts of this contract back and forth with their attorneys, my chief legal officer came to me and he said, Jim, we've got a problem. Okay, what is it? He said, their attorneys have made a mistake in the contract. And it's going to excuse us from having to pay them about a million dollars, a little over a million dollars in value. How do you want me to handle it? He knew very well how I was going to handle it. So I turned it on him and I said, what should we do here? He says, well, I think we need to do the right thing. I think we need to go to this other company and I think we need to tell them that they need to talk to their lawyers and get this provision changed. Great. That's the right thing to do. Would it be legal for us to go forward and sign the contract the way it was? Yes. And every court in the land would uphold it. Is it the right thing to do? When I have shaped somebody's hand and we've made an agreement, just because the attorneys put it down on paper wrong, does it make, all of a sudden make it the right thing? Well, next step in the story, he reaches out to the attorneys from the other side and says, guys, you made a mistake. We need to change this provision of the contract. And they said, oh, yeah, we did make a mistake. But we don't want our clients to know that we made a mistake, so we're not going to change that. So our, my chief legal officer comes back to me and says, what do we do now? We tried, right? We tried to do the right things. Now am I OK to just sign the agreement and take that extra million dollars? Or is there something more that's required of me? Even though it's legal, is there still something more that's required of me to be able to look myself in the mirror and be proud of who I am? Well, in this situation, I had to call up the CEO from the other company and say, I'm sorry, but we're not going to proceed with buying your company. And the reason we're not going to proceed is because we're not going to enter into an agreement that could be perceived as taking unfair advantage of you. We would be happy to reconsider if you will talk your attorneys into getting the contract right. But they're afraid of you and they're not willing to make that change. You can imagine how that went over for those attorneys that chose not to represent their client directly, right? We did end up buying the company. It ended up being a terrible mistake that we never should have bought that company. But at the end of the day, um, I have a lot of trust in my chief legal officer because I know that he was going to do the right thing. Sometimes doing the right thing is not the easy thing. You know, I, I told you a story just a minute ago about the guy that got the box of cookies with, uh, with $10,000 in it. Do you know how hard it is to return a bribe? <laughs> it's not an easy thing. Like, that took us so much time. Because we're like, okay, what do we do with the money now? Like, we've got to get it back to you. Well, when you wire any amount of money that's $10,000 or more, you have to disclose to the government what it's for. <laughs> okay, so we put on the form, this is a failed bribe. How do you think that goes for the company that's receiving that? Right? That's a challenging situation. I don't think they anticipated that's what was going to happen when they tried to bribe one of our employees, but I'll guarantee you the word gets around and no one tries to bribe our employees anymore. Um, it's, it's an important thing. So tip number five, your reputation is really what you have in life. At the end of the day, your money can be taken from you. Your, you might, may find situations where you have relationships that are taken away from you, but you can always, always get back up and you can rise again if your re reputation is intact. Now think about this for a second. How long does it take to build a good reputation? A lifetime, right? Every act that you do every single day is building that reputation. And how long does it take to tear that reputation down? Less than five minutes, right? You can work your entire life to build the person that you want to be and build a reputation, and then in one thoughtless moment, in one moment where you choose to rationalize, you can burn the whole thing down. There's a, a congressman I read earlier today that um, has chosen not to run for re-election because he's being investigated by the SEC, and um, He's going to plead guilty and he's going to be in jail for a while. Do you think that's what he was planning on happening when he first ran for Congress? <laughs> Probably not. But somewhere along the way, somebody that had built a really strong reputation chose to compromise. Chose to compromise their values and their ethics. Chose 
something, wealth or pride or you know, their personal standing in the community instead of their integrity. And the last chapter to that story is always the same. It's regret and it's ruin. Um, I think you guys can probably think of dozens and dozens of examples of this, but I would just say don't give up your reputation for anything. That is your most important asset. Now, I work for companies that we have brands, right? The Otterbox brand is the top selling brand of phone cases in the world. We have about 45% market share in the United States. That means for every um, dollar that's spent in the United States on a phone case, 45 cents of that comes to our company. We spend millions of dollars every year protecting our brand, protecting it against counterfeits, protecting it against um, quality problems, and we actively promote our brand to make sure that it stands for what we want it to stand for. Do you think we would ever, ever allow somebody to, to walk in and just trash our brand, to do something that would cause people to think less of our company? That kind of stuff happens every once in a while and it is devastating to companies. It's the exact same principle in your personal lives. You need to be constantly vigilant of your reputation. And you need to make sure that not only do you not do anything, but you don't put yourself in a situation where you could be accused of doing anything that could tear down your reputation. Many, many people have had major challenges in life because they've been falsely accused of things that they didn't do. Many people have been ruined in their life because they've been accused of things that they didn't do. You know what? The public usually doesn't care. They don't care about the difference between those two. All that matters to them is that you've been accused. You need to be careful. You need to be careful and avoid not just doing bad things, but you need to avoid the appearance of doing bad things. And that's, that's really important. And does that mean that sometimes you have to make sacrifices in life? Absolutely it does. But I'll tell you what, it's so much nicer to have a reputation where when you walk into a room, people smile, than when you walk into a room, people roll their eyes and start talking about you behind your back. I've seen lots of people. Um, everybody has a brand. Look at the faces on the screen. I bet if I were to ask you what the brand is of each of these people, you would all have an opinion. And yet, you know what? I would also guess that none of you have ever met any of these people. Your brand, their brand is based off of your perception of them and what they put out in the world. If I were to fill this room with the people closest to you in the world and put your picture up on the screen, what would they tell me your brand is? Is your brand somebody that is lazy? Is your brand somebody that is the kindest person in the world? What are you putting out in the world? Because that's, that's a really important thing, and that's largely going to determine the opportunity that you have in life. You know, there's a guy that I went to law school with, and I can say he was, he was one of, he is one of the least intelligent attorneys that I know. But he has a personality that people love him. They just absolutely love him. And he makes so much money, and he has so many long, genuine relationships. And it's not based on the fact that he's the best attorney around. It's based on how he makes other people feel. There's something really important to be said for that, because most people will judge you based on how they feel in your presence. And if you find that you have lots of relationships <coughs> in your life, maybe that's a question that you should be asking yourself. How do I make other people feel? Am I so focused on me that everybody sees that I'm focused on me, that it alienates people around me? And is there a way to change that equation? There is no better way to have long, healthy relationships than to forget yourself and focus on other people. And like I said at the very beginning, the best way to guard against making unethical decisions is to be focused in selfless ways, not on selfish things. Um, let me share with you a, a quick story. So there was a, a vendor that we were using, and we got to a point where we were about to terminate their services. They just weren't meeting our expectations. And we had a really tough meeting with them, and I said, look, you guys have 30 days to get this figured out. And if, if in 30 days you haven't figured it out, then we're going to move on and we're going to use one of your competitors because we can't keep going like this. Two days later, I get a call from somebody pretty high up in this business and said, you know what? We appreciate your partnership so much that we would like to send you and your wife on an all-expenses-paid trip to Rio for the 
for the Olympics. We'll get you tickets to every event. We'll set you up in a really nice hotel. And you can just go and you can enjoy this 10 day trip and we'll pay for the whole thing. What's really happening there? They're trying to see if I can be wrong, right? They're trying to see if I'm willing to put what would be a personal comfort for me ahead of what's best for the business, that I have a fiduciary responsibility to manage, right? Do you know how often this kind of thing happens in business? All the time. All the time. And one of the things that you've got to ask yourself is, are you willing to put yourself in a situation where people can question your motives? Are you willing to put yourself in a situation where they will believe that you've done something wrong, even if you haven't? I'll tell you, this company, not only did we not accept that offer for me and my wife to go to Rio, we also did not give them 30 more days to finish their contract. We terminated it immediately. Um, and that we did it according to the contract. We did it in a way that we were keeping our ethics, but at the same time, I'm not going to work with partners that are trying to bribe people, even if it is legal bribery, like this would be. Right? Um, the last thing that I want to share with you is tip number six, and it's the idea that doing good is more important than doing well. So for you English majors in the room, think about what that means. Doing well would be making a lot of money, having a lot of personal fulfillment. I'll tell you that doing good, meaning making a difference in the world, is far more influential. It will make your life be full of far more happiness over the long term. And so what do I, what do I mean when I say giving back? I can break it down into three easy categories. Maybe you could break it down into more, but I break it down into time, talent, and treasure, the three keys. Your time. Are you spending your time selfishly, or, or are you finding ways to give back, right? Every bit of what you give of yourself is inoculating you against bad decision making in terms of ethics, because you're choosing to focus on other people. Um, if there are causes that you're passionate about, are you volunteering? Are you finding ways to support those organizations? Your talent, what is it that you have the ability to do that other people don't? It may be something that you're naturally born with, it may be something that you've been educated to do, it may be a skill that you've been taught, but are you using those things to help other people? And the last, you're all going to make money in your life. And I know that that seems like a really distant thing when you're in school and you're eating ramen noodles for the 12th night in a row, but there will come a time when you will have extra money in your bank account. I, I hope that there will come a time that you'll have extra money in the bank. <laughs> It'll require paying out some student loans, and so maybe by 2060 you'll all be there. <laughs> um, but the, the reality is you're going to have to make decisions on what you do with those three commodities, your time, your talents, and your treasure. One of the things that I choose to do is I choose to volunteer. I'm on the board for a law school, for a business school. I'm actively involved in my church, and I'm on the board for a hospital chain. That takes a lot of time from somebody that's already very, very busy. I run two global companies, and yet I've got to, for my own benefit, to make sure that I'm in a good place, I've got to make sure that I'm finding ways to give. Now, I'm not telling you that so that you'll think well of me. I'm telling you that to say, it doesn't matter how busy you are. There is an opportunity and there is a time for you to be able to give back. There's always time for what's important. And if you choose to prioritize giving back, you will find a way to make it happen. And if you're choosing to prioritize other things in life ahead of that, and some people choose to do that, you're going to find that you live a life that's a little bit more focused on selfishness. My life is really full. And do you know what I don't have time to do? I don't have time to watch a lot of TV. I don't have time to play a lot of video games. But do you know how much regret I have at the end of the day when I spend my time giving and helping and trying to benefit other people? That's something that, you know, those smaller pleasures in life would never be able to deliver. And I'm not saying that TV and video games are bad. I am saying that if you choose to prioritize that over things that will make the world a better place, maybe you're not on the path that's going to lead to long-term happiness. You've got to be willing to stop and think, what is your impact going to be in the world? If you were to die walking out of this room today, what would your obituary say? What have you done that's made a difference? 
And what are you hoping to do that will make a difference? It doesn't matter what the cause is, but it does matter that you're trying to do something to make the world a better place. And I hope that you look for companies that also have that type of a, of a goal in mind. The companies that I manage, they all have the same mission statement. Four really simple words. We grow to give. What that means is I want every employee to grow as a person. I want them to grow in their skill set. I want our businesses to grow in terms of revenue and profitability. But there's a reason that all that growth needs to happen. So that we can turn around and give back to the community. One of the things that we do with our company to try and incentivize that is we give every employee what we call volunteer time off. We ask every employee to go out and spend three days a year volunteering in the community. We pay them to do that. And then we also close our company down for a day and we all go out and volunteer together. I can frankly care less if somebody uses their, their personal paid time off, but I do care very deeply if people are using their volunteer time off. And that's something that I track and I get reporting on. Because that's so fundamental to the culture of who we are. Right? Um, I would just ask you to think about the impact that you're having. And to think that the impact that you have in the world is really written in the hearts and the lives of the people that you surround yourself with. You can give a lot of money, you can give a lot of yourself, but if you do it too far away from yourself and you're neglecting the people that are closest to you, what you're ultimately going to find is not a lot of happiness goes with that. Um, the last thing I'll leave you with before I open it up for questions is, now is the time to decide. Now is the time for you to decide what kind of person you're going to be to set that vision for your future. Because if you don't decide now, and you wait until you get in the moment when you're being you know, persuaded or tempted with different things, you will find a way to rationalize. Decide now so that when you're in that situation, you're not trying to figure out what you should be doing. That you've already decided that you're going to be a person of integrity. You've already decided that you're willing to walk away from short-term gain if it means being able to look at yourself in the mirror. That you've already decided that you're going to treat other people well even if they don't treat you well. And if you decide those things now, it makes it so much more likely that you make the decision when that situation arises in the future. Um, the, the, you know, the, the end result of that is the wrong decisions never lead to lasting happiness. You can get away with things for a short period of time, but ultimately it catches up with you. And that's, that's the reality of it. I want to leave you with um, you know, a, a positive note that you can make a lot of money and you can be really happy in business. I do not believe that business is bad. I do not believe that business is evil. I believe that like anything else, it can be used for really bad purposes. And if it's done in an unethical way, it can hurt a lot of people. If you look at our country, the combination of democracy and capitalism has made us freer and more prosperous for a longer period of time than any civilization in the history of the world. We've had abuses both with democracy and with capitalism, but when those two things are done ethically and done in conjunction with each other, it's a really magical recipe. And it can save a lot of trouble in society and it can create a lot of prosperity that allows for a lot of advancement. Think of the diseases that would not have been cured but for the system that we have. Think of the lives that wouldn't have been changed, but for people's willingness and ability to engage in ethical business. So, um, this is the summary of the, the points that I have. Um, I'm not going to reread them to you, but I'll just pause here and, and ask if anybody has any questions before we conclude. Yes? <laughs> The hardest ethical decisions I've ever had to make are about people. They're about people that I'm trying to decide if they need a second chance or not, if they deserve a second chance. Because sometimes really good people make really bad decisions. I've crossed enough bridges where I've turned down money that I that, that one doesn't face me anymore. What challenges me is when somebody's made a mistake and the decision is in my lap to say, does this person get another chance, or have they crossed the line? I've had to draw some lines in my life as I make those kind of decisions. 
I've decided that if anybody is willing to be dishonest, I'm not willing to work with that person. So if you lie, cheat, or steal, you can expect that when that comes across my desk, you're not going to have a job anymore. I've also decided that if somebody has the right attitude and they make mistakes, I'm far more likely to work with them. I'm far more likely to find a way for them to continue to have their job and have an opportunity to rehabilitate themselves. I think you'll find that I'm not alone in those judgments. If you have a good attitude and people around you know that you have a good attitude, you're going to deserve far more leniency, and that's, that's a pattern that you're going to see throughout your career. I think you'll also find that when you're in those situations where you have to make decisions about people's employment, that one of the most influential things that's going to play in your decision making is how you feel around that person, and it's largely driven by their attitude, by the way that they view the world and the way that they treat other people. So. There you go. Other questions? Yes. So what do you do when you go to a company, you have a great boss, and then um, they end up leaving, retiring, whatnot, new boss comes in, and basically is starting to destroy the company. Does your loyalty li uh, lie with the company, or trying to reform and reform the boss, or look elsewhere? I wish I could give you a one-size-fits-all answer to that question, but I can't. It's going to be situational. And one of the things that you're going to notice is that you learn a lot from that first boss, but there will come a time for all of you that you're no longer with that person anymore. And you're going to have to decide what ethics looks like for you. And if somebody's asking you to do things that would cause you to compromise who you are, maybe it's time to move on to a different organization. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is sometimes by staying there and doing the right thing, you can actually be the influence for good in the organization. You've got to be really careful though. You've got to be really careful that you're not the one that gets caught. Not that, let me rephrase that, that you're not the one that gets caught compromising yourself. That you don't get put in a situation where you are rationalizing your way, rationalizing your way into making a bad decision. Because that happens all the time. It really does. There's another question over here. Um, I was kind of along with this, like what, if there's somebody higher up, um, like a boss or something that's behaving, or a manager that's behaving unethically, do you try and fix that issue, or do you try and go to their manager and report unethical behavior and try and risk your relationship with them or your job? Like at what point do those, like which one is worth more than the other? Yeah. You know, that's a really common situation, especially in the early part of your career, where you're going, to be, you're going to be in a situation and somebody above you on the hierarchy or on the food chain asks you to do something that violates your personal ethics. And you've got to decide how do I handle this situation. It may surprise you to hear me say that in most situations, there is a way through that situation where you keep your job and you keep your ethics. You don't have to stand up in the first instance and say, I will not do that if you are unethical and I'm never going to work for you again. Matter of fact, if that's your first approach to this situation, you're going to find that you go through a lot of jobs in your career. There's other ways to look at that. So step one, you've got to be persuasive. You've got to think creatively and you've got to find other answers to this situation that don't involve you violating your ethics. There's some resources that you have available for you. A really important one is going to be your company handbook because there's going to be some conduct that's prohibited there. And when you um, sit down with your boss and say, if I do this, it's going to be violating company policy as it's in the handbook here, but I found another way to go about this, usually people are not, they want to maintain the, the impression that they're ethical. Even if they know that they've sold out a long time ago, most people are not willing to say, okay, I don't care what's right and wrong, just do this. And you'll find that in a lot of those situations, not only will they respect you for having found a better answer, but they're also going to breathe a sigh of relief that they're not having to compromise their ethics again. Um, some situations you're going to have whistleblower hotlines within companies, especially within larger companies, and sometimes you may need to take advantage of that. Sometimes you may need to seek advice from other people to say, how do I handle this situation? Be careful who you talk to in those situations. But I would, I would tell you most situations that I've ever been in like that or I've ever seen, somebody that is willing to think creatively 
and is willing to put some real effort into it can work through those situations without having to stand up and take a, a moral stand that's going to make them seem self-righteous to other people. There's a really, really good book called The Business Ethics Field Guide, written by a guy named Brad Eagle. Um, it's something that I give to every single person that becomes a manager in our company, and I ask them to read it, um, because I want them to be equipped with the skills that they need to deal with complex um, ethical situations. That can include conflicts of interest. It can include when you've made a deal and all of a sudden circumstances change and that deal doesn't make sense anymore. It can include when somebody asks you to do something that violates your ethics. There's very common situations that arise. And by studying and understanding how other people have gotten through those situations, you're going to get a lot of ideas on how you can do that. I would recommend that book to all of you, The Business Ethics Field Guide, uh, written by a guy named Brad Eagle. And it's, it's really simple to read, but it is one of those books that can be a, a deal changer for your entire career. Other questions? Yes? So when you um, pick what to do in your career, like as a general area, how did you go about narrowing it down to something more specific? Um, so when I was in fifth grade, I read a book by an author named John Grisham called The Pelican Brief. And I decided that I wanted to be a lawyer. There's a really good movie made about it now. I had never met a lawyer in my life. As a matter of fact, nobody in my family had gone to college before, and my parents didn't tell me that that was a bad decision, and so I just decided that I was going to be a lawyer. And so I went to school, and then I went to law school, and I became an attorney, and I found that I was pretty good at it, was having some success, and then one of my clients approached me and said, why don't you leave your law firm and come and work for us and be our chief legal officer? And it was Kurt Richardson, one of the guys I showed on the screen earlier. And so after talking with my wife, because I never make any important decisions in life without consulting with her because she's the smartest, best person I know, decided that I was going to leave that law firm and go to work for this, this guy managing the legal work for all of his businesses. And about a little under a year into that, we were in a board meeting, and he looked across the table and he said, I'm really tired. I think I'm going to retire. And I thought, oh my goodness, I just left my law practice to come and work for a guy, and now I don't even know who I'm going to be working for. And I said, well, we better get working on finding a, a replacement for you. And he, he got kind of a funny look on his face, and he looked at me and he said, I think I'm looking at it. And that's one of those moments where I had a bit of a panic attack. <laughs> and I looked at him and I said, Kurt, I've got to tell you, as your attorney, I have an obligation to tell you that's a really bad decision. <laughs> I'm not a business person. I've never been to business school. There's one thing that they don't, well, there's a lot of things they don't teach you in law school, but one of them is how to run a business or a bunch of businesses. And he said, why don't you go and talk to your wife about it, pray about it. We'll get back together next week and we'll decide what you want to do. And so I left his office and I picked up my phone and I called my wife and I said, Megan, I think Kurt's having a stroke. He just asked me to be the CEO. And my dear, wonderful wife, who's my biggest supporter, laughed out loud and said, yeah, that could never work. <laughs> and as I was on the phone with her, I noticed that somebody else was trying to call, and I looked down, and it was my boss again. And so I asked my wife to hold, and I flipped over, and he said, hey, I just talked to my wife about it. She loves the idea. We're going to announce it this afternoon. i got to go by. <laughs> and so within a period of about five minutes, I went from being the happiest attorney in the world to being the most inexperienced and terrified CEO that you will ever see. <laughs> that's how I got, <laughs> that's how my career decisions happen. But I'll tell you this, there are times in all of our lives when you need to look inside of you and say, what do I really have to offer? And you need to be willing to listen and to sometimes disregard the voices that say that you're not enough, that you're not good enough, that you're not smart enough, that you're gonna fail. Because those internal voices can talk to you out of really important things in your life. I knew that I had a few things going for me. I knew that I could figure out a lot of what needed to be done. I knew that I would always choose to do the right thing because I had made that choice in my life a long time ago. And I also knew that I didn't have to do it alone, that I could surround myself with really smart people. And so I agreed to move forward with it. 
And a lot of years later, I've learned a lot of things. And I've read more books. I mean, if you were to stack the business books that I've read, it would go beyond the ceiling here. Because I've had to invest the time and the energy to learn the things that I didn't know before. But it's made such a difference in my life, a willingness to be constantly learning and, and trying to figure things out. If I would have listened to the initial voices in my mind that said, you can't do that, you're not qualified to do that, I could have absolutely talked myself out of an opportunity to help a lot of people. And that's, that's just the way it goes. I hope that when you guys are put in situations where you have to look inside yourself and battle your own um, you know, challenges with self-worth and your own sense of inadequacy, that you're able to stand up and say, you know what? Maybe I can do some of these things. Maybe there is more good in me than I had first thought. Because that's a really important thing that you're going to cross. You're going to cross that bridge, I promise you. Any other questions? Yes? First off, I want to say thank you so much. This has been really cool. You've offered us a lot of uh, helpful tips and guidelines that really can keep our lives and our business career. So thank you. It's really cool. Um, I wanted to ask, though, I don't think... I believe that um, unless it's a deep-rooted conviction or motivation in each individual's life, that these things won't be applied. Or that um, unless they truly agree with everything and want to make very serious steps that they're very convicted about to follow this, that it, it might not even work out for everyone. Um, what do you think the deepest, most fundamental um, motivation is for living a moral life? And, uh, living with um, that's a really good question, and so let me just answer and say what is the motivation for me may be different than the motivation for other people. Um, I'm a person of faith, and that motivates me deeply in life. But I'll tell you what is the primary motivation even for that, and that's a desire to help other people. It goes back to the same principle that I've mentioned again and again and again. If your focus is internal and selfish, you're going to find that you're able to rationalize your way into a lot of bad decisions. If your focus is external and on other people, you're going to find that it's a lot easier to make moral decisions in your life. It just simply is. The, the biggest impediment to your moral decision making is your own ability to rationalize. And each of you are going to have to decide what is right or wrong for you. I would submit to you that not all things are subjective. Murder is not a right thing. Rape is not a right thing. Stealing is not a right thing. Lying is not a right thing. And you can all create hypothetical situations that are never actually going to happen in real life to explain why there are exceptions to those rules. And this will sound callous, but I don't care about those hypotheticals. I care about real life, and I care about how your decisions impact you and the people around you. Don't be, don't be so quick to cast aside the wisdom of traditional concepts of, yeah, if you harm other people, there's probably something wrong about that. And if you're helping other people, there's probably some good in there. And that's a really strong witness test to think about. Um, yeah, I want to thank you guys all and hope that you have a great rest of your education. <laughs>